How you guys doing? Hey, how's your, how's your summer going? Dang, bro. Travis, that, that makes me happy to hear. That makes me happy to hear. Well, hey, welcome, everybody. It is great to be with you. Just just to give you a heads up, we can, we can turn on the music a little bit. Uh, just to give you a heads up, we are going to be meeting this week, next week, and the following week. All right, so invite your friends. We want you guys to be here. It's going to be a good time, a good vibe. We would love it if you guys came and invited your friends uh, to come and experience it. Well, before we get into it, we have a few announcements. First one is, yes, in the summer, the church still meets. I know it's kind of crazy, but we have weekend services, 5 o'clock on Saturday, and then Sundays at 9 a.m. and 10.45. Uh, please come. We would love it if you guys join us and we're there. We would love to see you. Uh, also, please be praying for us because in two weeks, this Friday, we are going to Southern California. Wow. Well, it... We are excited. We are pumped. Uh, so please be praying for us. Please be praying for the students that are able to come. Uh, it's going to be a really, really great trip. Uh, well, hey, that's all the announcements that we have. I'm going to invite Maddie up to the stage. Maddie, where are you at? Perfect. Maddie is going to bring the exhortation. Give it up for Maddie. How's everyone doing tonight? It's very empty. This is really weird. It's empty over there. Okay. Yesterday, I was reading a congrats grad card I got from one of my uncles, and in it is a memory that he had recalled about a time many years ago when I was about three or so. Um, I had practically risked breaking bones, jumping off of stairs, and over one of those, you know, the child gates that they put at the end of the stairs. Um, I had one goal in mind, and I didn't hesitate, wanting to jump into my uncle's arms from those stairs. Reading this card brought tears to my eyes, not only because it's a memory I didn't know about, but because of the love that was shown in it. These last couple months, I've occasionally been asking myself one specific question. How is it that I have come this far? Graduation. And I know for many of us, it's kind of an an oh, uh. <laughs> I know for many of us, it's kind of an obvious answer, right? God. And yes, I have that same answer. Here's the thing. For me, it's not always as easy as finding answers right in front of my face. I have to go looking sometimes. I have to search for his love. It's hidden in laughs or in messages so significant they can make you cry. A verse that I've had on my mind for a while is from 1 John, book 4, verse 19. It states, we love because he first loved us. In similar words, many of those who love you, whether it's familial love, friendly love, or, or romantic love, please cherish these relationships because that is God telling you that he loves you. He loves you so much, he was willing to die for you. This is how far I've come. After this year, I now know without a doubt that God loves me because unlike an answer I might get so obviously, he told me that, he told me that through so many people. I just had to look for it. When I was very young, I used to think that as I got older, I would physically be hearing of his voice in my head but I'm continuing to learn that I need to search for him. I pray that you strive to search in his word, the Bible. We should continue to look in others also. And above all, we should love as much as, as, much as we can. As, John, as 1 John 4, 8 says, if we don't love, we don't know God because God is love. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray for these kids tonight that if they don't quite yet know love, that they find it in you. And through this message, God, whatever it is, because I don't know it, I pray that they find you, your love. Jesus, I pray that your your hand, your fire rests on these students' heads. 
the Holy Spirit, I pray that you rest your hand on these spirits, on these kids' heads, and that they find a clear message tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, Maddie. That was great. Hey, would you guys stand up? Yeah, let's stand up. Can come on up to the front. We got a lot of high energy for you tonight. We're hoping you got your dancing shoes on. Can you raise your hand if you got your dancing shoes on? There we go. Here we go. I want to hear you guys singing loud, too, all right? Here we go. Staring into your eyes makes my heart come alive. Suddenly brought to life when I met you. Reaching beyond the skies, running deep, stretching wide. Perfect love realized here with you. Now this love. This love is for real, you will never let go, never let go. Oh, it's more than just words of me on my control, out of control. Come on, sing it, pull me closer. This is real love, this is real love. Yeah. This is real love. Come on, you guys know what to do. Let me see your feet jump. Here we go. is real love. Amen. The love of Jesus is the real love we're talking about. This next song is called This Is Our God. There's a part of this song that's talking about altars. Raise your hand if you didn't even know what an altar is. You guys heard this? It's kind of a weird word, right? Let me give you a little biblical history. Let me slap that on you right here. Uh, altars in the Bible, the Israelites, when they wanted to respond to what God was doing, his faithfulness, 
in their lives, what would they do? They'd build a what? They'd build an altar. And that was a symbol to show that they were not going to forget, no matter how many generation, generations passed, they wouldn't forget the Lord's faithfulness for that circumstance. We kind of need to do this in our lives. Like we, I wish we had this symbol in our lives of memorializing what God has done in our lives. Maybe you could think right now, what has God done in my life that's so significant to me? I just think about his forgiveness of my sin, his welcoming me into his kingdom by the work that he has done. I want to build an altar that reminds me of this grace and this fullness that I get to experience. So as we sing this song, let us remember the walls that we called sin and shame, the prisons we couldn't escape. But he came, and he died, and he rose, and those walls are rubble. Let's sing, remember. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. And they were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came, and he died, and he rose, and those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. And those giants are dead now. Come on, every voice, sing. This is our God. This is who he is. Come on, every voice, let's do it. This is our God. This is who He is. Come on, sing. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore. He bore the cross. He the grave. And let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear. Remember that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Now those altars, now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never once did he fail? And he never will. Come on, sing. This is our God. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, and let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of my sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh. Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him, this is our God, this is who He is, He loves us, this is our God. 
you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God God, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We just build an altar to you right now in our hearts to memorialize what you've done. You're the one who pulled us out of that pit, who rescued us from the grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, your name, God. Just thank you for all of that. 
and all that that means for our lives. And we just, I just pray that we would worship you with our whole lives, not just in these beautiful moments, but in every moment that we live and breathe. We thank you, God. Amen. You guys can have a seat. All right. Hey, if you were uh, sitting all spaced out and like towards the back, can we kind of all just like come in a little closer? Everybody already went on summer vacation, which I'm excited for them, but I like to have you guys all, all nice and close. Thanks, Josh. You're such a good servant. You're so thoughtful. Oh, thank you. Well, welcome, happy summer. Uh, we are gonna start a new series tonight and um, we're hoping that this series will be really helpful for us all. Um, next week, Josh is gonna be teaching on being captive um, to fear and then Jarrell will be teaching on being captive to approval. Um, tonight, I'm gonna introduce the series and then teach on being captive to pride. Um, the Bible teaches us that there are all kinds of things that we are captive or slaves to. And everywhere we turn, someone is discouraged by something that is going on in their life. And they can't figure out how to change it. And a lot of times we feel hopeless and tired and just like overwhelmed by that. But the reason we wanted to teach this series is because one of the many incredible promises of God is that he has provided a way for freedom through his son. Um, not that long ago, I was watching um, the movie Tangled. And for those of you who have never watched it before, it is the story of Rapunzel. Do most of you guys know this? I'm sure some of the boys are probably like, no way, I was not watching that. It's my sister's movie. It's so annoying, okay? So I'm gonna catch you up real quick, okay? Rapunzel is a girl that's held captive in a tower. She has really long, magical hair. And when she was a baby, an old lady kidnaps her from her parents, who were the king and queen. And then that old lady takes her to a tower and raises her as her own daughter so she can use Rapunzel's magical hair to keep herself from ever growing old, okay? But the part of the story that I wanna focus on is the day that Rapunzel leaves the tower for the first time. Her kidnapping fake mom, Mother Gothel, has convinced Rapunzel that staying in the tower is what's best for her. Um, the world is unsafe, there are ruffians, and thugs, that's what she's told her, that will get her if she goes out. And so that's why she's chosen to stay trapped in a tower for 18 years. Until her birthday, when Rapunzel decides that she wants to go see these floating lights that are in the sky every year on her birthday. So there's this scene where um, a local criminal, Flynn Ryder, has accidentally found her castle, and he met Rapunzel, and she is trying to decide if she's gonna leave her tower of captivity with him and go experience the light festival um, or not. And when you're watching the movie, they build this tension within her. And it is super frustrating as the viewer to watch, okay? She's running and racing and dancing and chasing and walking on the grass for the first time, right? That's the song, that's the song if you know it. And then, um, and then she's crying and worrying about crushing her fake kidnapping mom's heart if she leaves the tower. And then the next moment, she thinks it's the best day ever and she's like flying through the air. And then the next minute she's crouched in a, crave, or in a cave and she's crying and she's thinking about going back to be a slave to Mother Gothel. And you find yourself asking, why doesn't she just run as fast as she can and be free? Why is she believing that she should stay a prisoner to a kidnapping, emotionally abusive freak? You know, I mean, that's what crossed my mind. And why can't she see that this guy is also trying to get her to go back to captivity for his own selfish gain? It's like, Rapunzel, just go, right? Get out of there. And nobody watches that movie and thinks she should go back to the old passive aggressive hag kidnapper, okay? It's obvious, everybody knows that. And I'm sharing this story with you because actually, metaphorically, it's perfect for introducing our new series that we are calling captive. It's the sin that we are captive to and the freedom that Jesus provides. See, like Rapunzel, we sometimes don't realize that we are choosing to stay locked in our tower of sin for years. When there is freedom and family and light and hope and a whole kingdom that is ours. And we don't always recognize captivity for what it is. We can go through our days and there are things that will come up over and over again in our relationships and in our lives that are hard, okay? There's conflict, there's misunderstanding, rejection, disappointment, shame, and none of it feels good. And when we have those thoughts on repeat, it consumes our mind. 
Why does this keep happening to me? Why can't I stop doing this? Why do I always feel this way? Why don't they like me? Why are there so many jerks in the world? That's the one that I think pretty regularly, okay? And those are really common questions and that most of us have asked many, many times. And those questions are a response to what we're feeling. We're stuck in pain and we don't like it. There's something or someone that has hurt us. And so we ask these questions and we feel like there's no answers to them. And unfortunately, because we are constantly fixated on what is hurting us, we don't realize that we may be the constant that needs to be fixed. See, there's more going on here than how everyone else is letting us down. Can we see ourselves? We want to have the feeling, we will have the feeling that this isn't supposed to be this way. And we want to feel better. So we want freedom from our discontent. And so we seek out something that will make us feel good only to be temporarily relieved. And then we are back trapped in our unhappiness again. And then it starts over. Okay, we want to feel better. We find something that makes us feel good. We are temporarily relieved. And then we are trapped and just a slave to that cycle. See, the very thing that you think will give you the freedom that you want is actually the thing that's gonna keep you captive. And if you live for anything but God, if you choose anything over God, that's sin. That's how easy it is. And it's sin because you're worshiping it. You're choosing it over him. You're devoted to it, you're a slave to it, okay? It can be a new look, new clothes, romantic relationships, fresh gossip, likes on social media, acting out to get attention, people pleasing, succeeding in a hobby or activity, making money, okay? We're, we all have different things. We are all captive to whatever our thing is. But new looks get old, new clothes have been seen, romantic relationships and fresh gossip gets around and dies out. People pleasing becomes more demanding. Likes on social media grow, grow cold. Uh, acting out to get attention is forgotten and succeeding in a hobby takes more time, just more and more of our time. And making money just gets spent. Our devotion to chasing after whatever we think is gonna make us happy consumes us over and over and over again. And there are so many places in the Bible that it talks about this stuff. It was happening then, and if we take five minutes to look around, check social media, we can see it's happening now. The devil doesn't have any new tricks, same old tricks, same old tricks. He's just doing them over and over and over again on all of us. But there's these great verses, and I think these tell us the truth that we need to walk through. And 2 Timothy 2, 25 through 26 says, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. And this is what he wants. He wants for us to worship anything that isn't Jesus, anything. It doesn't matter. He doesn't care what it is. It could even be a good thing, okay? It could even be like, um, I just really wanna go to church and I want this one person to like me and I'm just gonna like be at church all the time and like that's just gonna be the thing that I'm gonna do. And like he'll, he can even use that if we worship that more than we worship our king. It's crazy, but it's anything, anything other than God. In Romans 7, 23, it says, there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. The power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in 2 Peter 2, it's talking about false teachers and it says they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption for you are a slave to whatever controls you. So these verses beg the question, what controls us? What controls you? What controls me? What are the things that we think about day after day that keep us up at night, that we're preoccupied with? When you ask, why can't I stop doing this? What is it that controls you, that you're a slave to? We are hoping that through the next several weeks, we will all be able to experience 2 Timothy 25 through 26, really experience it, and that we'll have a heart change from learning the truth 
that we will come to our senses and escape the sins that we have been held captive by. And I feel like I could make a case that the origin of sin is pride. So it's like, I know like Josh has got whatever he has, fear, and then Jarrell's got approval, but I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say, I think, I think, I think it's pride, okay? Uh, Adam and Eve wanted to be like God, pride, okay? Cain, just the next generation, he wanted to be better than his brother, pride. I mean, I just, right? So we can see this is a big one for all of us. And every horrible abuse, every affair, every broken family, addiction, oppression, all of these things are sins that are rooted in pride. Someone believed that they were more important than someone else in all of those things. And we're all captive to pride in one way or another. I wanted to read you, here's a list of things that I found about uh, what pride is, little definitions, okay? It says, pride is being selfish, concerned primarily with one's own, with one's own profit, personal profit or pleasure, lacking in concern for others. It's thinking excessively about yourself. It's an overemphasis on self-love. Thinking the worth of ourself is higher than others. A preoccupation with our image or self. Pride is narcissism, where we're in love with our image or self. Pride is self-centered, that everything revolves around us. Pride wants to focus and keep the focus on self. And then there's self-worship which the Gospel Coalition uh, said self-worship is the fastest growing religion. It's the act of idolizing oneself, right? Now, if you're like me, you probably all had someone's name that came up in mind when you think of those things. It's like, oh, it's so-and-so, mm -hmm. yep, so-and-so, I know them, they're like that, right? Yeah, we do. That very thought that you just had of comparing yourself to someone else, that's pride. You all just sinned. I just, I just led you all in tempta into temptation and you sin. And just so you know, if you lead someone into temptation, that's sin. So that's on me. So I'll take that up with the Lord later, okay? But the sin of pride is so much more encompassing than we think. When we think of pride, a lot of the time we just think of superiority and that's it, but it's way more than that. Okay? Superiority is when we compare ourselves to others and we believe and act on the belief that we are better or more important than other people. Inferiority, which we wouldn't seem, it doesn't seem like pride right away, is actually when we compare ourselves to others and believe and act on the belief that we are lower in status or quality and less important than other people. And both of these things are pride because in both instances, we are consumed with thinking about ourselves. And like I said before, there are a ton of people in the Bible who were slaves to pride. I want us to look at a few instances with Jesus and the disciples, and you can see that we are not the only ones who need to hear the truth and come to our senses. In Mark 8, 9, and 10, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what's about to happen to him. And as of chapter 8, the disciples have witnessed a ton of what of what Jesus has done, okay? They've seen Jesus heal people. Deaf people could hear, sick people were well, lame people could walk, uh, disabled people were healed. There was food for a couple people. He made, he made enough food for 5,000 people, okay? He walked on water. He silenced and stilled a storm. And they had witnessed miracle after miracle. And so all these people heard about Jesus. And so all these people were coming from everywhere to be with Jesus and consequently with the disciples. And they were experiencing all of the power of Jesus. They were seeing his love, witnessing how he didn't have favorites, watching how he honored and loved the lowliest. And that is the context for these three stories, okay? In Mark 8, it says, Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and rise after three days. He spoke openly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and looking at the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine if Jesus called you Satan? Brutal, okay? You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. It's like, Peter, you're thinking about your concerns here. In Mark 9, it says, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after he's killed, he will rise three days later. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent because on the way they had been arguing with one another about who among them was the greatest. 
In Mark 10, taking the 12 aside again, he began to tell them things that would happen to him. See, we're going to go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they're going to condemn him to death. And they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And then he'll rise after three days. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, Teacher, we want to do whatever, we want you to do whatever we ask you. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? And they answered him, allow us to sit at your right and your left hand of glory. Three times, Jesus tells them that he's going to die. He literally is telling them that he's going to be beaten and killed. And three times, they showed that they were only concerned with themselves, Consumed with their pride. Preoccupied. Can you imagine how Jesus felt? Jesus is about to be brutally killed and they're only thinking about their own glory. And I'm sure we have all heard of families fighting over estates, right? Over the money and belongings when someone dies. And it's brutal to watch, that's brutal to watch. But can you seriously imagine if you told your family that you were gonna die in a month and the first thing that your siblings or your family said well, was, well, can you post pics of me with you on there so then everybody knows that in the family, like, you like me best? And that when people like back, they think, oh, that, is just, that must be the greatest family member because they were there in all of their pics. Like, can you, I mean, can you imagine if they said that? I honestly can't believe that that is actually like what the disciples were doing, Okay. They were so concerned about their status. And honestly, what was so great about the disciples anyway? Anything cool that had been done was done by Jesus and in his strength and his power. None of them could have done anything without him and yet they're fighting over who the greatest is. Thaddeus Williams says, the more self-absorbed we are, the less awe we experience. And awe, right, is the root of awesome. Okay, so you're awestruck. Okay, that's what that means. So the more self-absorbed we are, the less awe we experience. The less awe we experience, the less fully and freely we are ourselves. Do you get that? The more we focus on ourselves, there isn't room for anything else. And if there isn't room for anything else, then our mind is captive to focusing on us. We can't focus on his grace or his mercy, or his goodness. There are so many amazing things that should overwhelm us with awe and wonder, right? But we see with the disciples, they were more interested in being great than being in awe. And it wasn't enough that they were gonna be forgiven of their sin and in heaven for all of eternity. They wanted to sit close to him so that they could be seen as the greatest. And I just wonder, how much is our relationship with Jesus like that? How much of it? Jesus tells the disciples over and over in these passages that it isn't about how great you are. They shouldn't be focused on that. It's about denying yourself and being last and serving. In Mark 8, he says, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their life? Mark 9 says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. And Mark 10 says, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. So even though Jesus had all the power to heal and perform miracles, to do anything he wanted, he was selfless. Timothy Keller says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. I would like to try to do that. I feel like Drell's really good at that. Greg's really good at that. I feel like the Lord's trying to show me a sign by having me work for both of those guys. I think it's like, here, Jenny, this is what you need, okay? But if you've ever been around someone that's humble, okay, someone that when you have something good happen to you, they are truly happy for you. Humble people, they're great. They're not needy. They're not jealous. They're not fake. They're not impatient. They listen to you and you feel heard and you feel valued when you're with them and they follow through on their word. They don't think they're too good for anyone or that they're entitled to things. And everybody wants a friend like that, right? 
that's exactly, I was like, sign me up. Where are they? Oh, no, nowhere. I don't know where they are. I'm definitely not one, right? Jarrell, you can all have Jarrell, okay? But this is what we're supposed to be as Christians. First Peter 5.5 5 says, and all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And there might be a lot of people in this world that I am okay opposing and them opposing me, like a lot. Like I'm not even gonna name them because we're not gonna get into all of that, right? But I'm pretty sure that if all of us were to make a list of who we were okay with being in opposition to us, God is not one that we want to put on that list, right? If God opposes you in the Bible, if you read it, you are gonna get it. Like there are plagues. I mean, there is just so much crazy stuff that goes down, okay? In John 8, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Guys, a slave cannot free themselves, right? They're a slave. They need someone from the family to set them free. And that is, that son, that's Jesus. The son can set us free. That's exactly what he promises to do for us. It's what he already has done for us. In Philippians 2, it says, you must have the same attitude that Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human king. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. See, we needed him to be set free. And he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died for us. Can you imagine what this world would look like if the gospel was the most important thing to us? Okay, I have read through the gospel now multiple times tonight. Has it actually hit you? And what I mean is if that things that are the most important to Jesus were most important to you, that the truth that he became man, that he lived a sinless life, that he died for you. He rose again and he paid the cost for us to be in eternity with him. If those facts were the most important things to us, how would we live? I recently heard a story by a pastor. Um, it's so good, I'm gonna read it to you. It says, some years ago I saw a young woman who clearly he's in church, who clearly wasn't a believer, didn't seem to know anybody else and would come in and then run out really quickly at the end of the service. She looked a lot like other people that I knew who did that. And one time I caught her after the service and I said, hi. And she says, hi, well, I'm coming in, but um, I'm not sure if I believe what you guys do, but I'm, but I'm intrigued. And so I basically said, fine, well, how did you find out about this church? And she told me the story. The story is she worked for a network, a TV network in New York City, and she hadn't been with the network very long when she made a really bad mistake, a very bad mistake, a career-ending kind of mistake. And she thought she'd get the ax, and that would be it. But her boss, who had a lot of credibility, a lot of credibility with his superiors and everyone else, went in and took the blame for her and said, I didn't train her, I didn't prep her. If you're gonna be mad at somebody, be mad at me, but don't fire her. And now when he did that, he lost credibility. He lost social capital. No doubt about that, but obviously she kept her job and that was over. So she went in to try to thank him and he says, no, 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 don't thank me. And she wasn't satisfied actually with him saying, don't even worry about it. She said, no, no. Okay, I've had bosses in the past who've taken the credit for the things that I've done. That happened all the time. I've never had a boss take the blame for something that I've done. That's not human nature. Human nature is to take credit for what people underneath me have done, but if somebody does something underneath me wrong, then you blame them. So take credit for what's good, blame them for what's bad. You took the blame, and I've never seen that before. And so, of course, he's still trying to be modest and talking. She's like, yes, how nice. And she says, but finally she pressed him enough, and he says, okay, I'll tell you this. You've made me say it. I want you to know I'm a Christian. And my whole life is based on a man who took the blame for me. And that actually tends to shape the way in which I do everything in my life. And she said, where do you go to church? Right? How pumped 
are me and Jarrell or Josh and Nathan going to be if, like, I go and talk to this kid and they're like, hey, and I'm like, what are you doing here? I don't know if I believe, but let me tell you about this friend of mine from school. That's why I'm here, right? It's because Jesus is so selfless. It's because God has his son take the blame for us that we get to be selfless as well. We can let what God has done for us shape us in the way in which we do everything. It doesn't make any sense to be selfish when you understand that you have been given everything. We can't live as selfish, self-absorbed, prideful people if we actually understand the reality of the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, you are not your own, you were bought with a price. Jesus gave his life for you, that was the price. He gave up heaven and his glorious position to come and live and suffer and be persecuted and tortured and killed so that you can be free. So that you could be fully known and fully loved. Protected, every painful thing can be redeemed. Guys, think of those painful things in your life. I know what they are for me. And he, he is going to redeem them all. And he already has some. That's who he is. Can we see this? Do we understand this? Or are we caught up in what we're going to get at the estate sale? <laughs> How can we be set free from being captive to pride? Well, according to 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26, you learn the truth about who Jesus is, what he is like, and what he's done. So we read our Bible, we listen to sermons or podcasts, we spend time with people that know him, and we ask all of our questions, okay? Second thing we do, we come to our senses by seeing our status clearly and accepting the grace that we need. We're praying and asking God to help us see our sin and weaknesses so that we can receive his grace and forgiveness. We get together with other believers who can help us identify our sins and weaknesses and encourage us to grow in our relationship with Christ. When you were reading through the pride list and thinking of all the other people's names, you're obviously all very good at helping people find out what their sin is, right? Okay, so you, you, guys, you guys have plenty of people to do this with. And three, we thank God and worship him and live out the gospel. We take time to do things that help us see all of God's blessings and praise him for them. Good music. I got to listen to Diana Ross last night. That chick can sing. She threw down. I, I, I'm going to sing better than her in heaven, though. I feel like it. Um, good friends, right? When you see humble people, good friends, they point you to a, a, our God. It's a blessing. If you go to the beach or watch a sunset, right? This is what God has created. It's gonna make you worship. It's gonna make you in awe. If you eat Mexican food, it is impossible to be mad or sad or anything when you're eating Mexican food. You're going to worship God. I do every time. Guacamole, let's go, okay? For Jarrell, if you have a great cup of coffee, right? Great cup of coffee. But we've got to make room to be in awe of him. We've got to find ways to serve people like he served us. So I'm going to have the band come up. There's one last song that we're going to sing. Uh, I was thankful because uh, this song is just so good. And these lyrics tell us true things about our God, and they take us straight into worshiping him. See, there's no reason... There's no reason that makes sense for us to stay captive to our pride. There isn't any reason that we should wait and stay stuck in our sin or be a slave to whatever the devil wants us to do, okay? Don't stay in the tower, right? Don't stay in the tower. Run. I want you to accept his grace and be free. Let me pray for us and, we'll, and then we'll sing. Lord God, uh, Lord, we spend so much time putting so many things into our brain and our hearts that we don't leave enough room to really understand the fullness of the gospel. Lord, I pray that everyone in this room will just experience awe of you, that they will think about the gospel, that they will think about the sacrifice, that they will see all of the ways that you can redeem them and make them free. The promise of heaven, of no tears and no sin, no pain, no cancer, no pride, none of it. Lord, we praise you and thank you for who you are. Help us to be faithful to you like you are to us. In your name, amen.
Amen. You guys can come on up.
give me mine You say that I am free How can it be? How can it be? Let's just sing that chorus one more time. You plead my cause. You plead my cause. You right my wrong. Give your life, you gave your life to give me mine, and you say that I am free. How can it be? As Father, you say that we're free, and we just want all the glory and the honor to go to you. God, I just pray that you would make us open to receive your grace and forgiveness that we can be free in you. Amen. It's good to be with you guys tonight.